Uh, yes, so thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you as well to the um, organizers for inviting me to, um, to give this talk. So I'm very excited to, um, to be here and tell you a little bit about the research that we're doing in my group. Um, I do have kind of a disclaimer before starting and it's that you won't be seeing any Schrodinger equation here. So I feel a little bit out of place, but I think the machine learning approaches, um, particularly the, the generative AI is still um, hopefully quite interesting uh, to many of you and you can think about how you could apply it in your systems. So I'm, I'm an assistant professor at Chalmers, by the way, um, here in Sweden. And an outline of the talk uh, for today. So we're gonna start with a, a quick introduction to generative AI for molecular engineering. Then we're gonna talk about some key molecular engineering challenges, in particular um, uh, in the drug discovery domain. So we'll start by talking about engineering targeted protein degradation modalities. Then we're gonna talk about synthesizability constrained molecular design, data sharing challenges in chemistry. Um, and then we're gonna end with a little bit of um, uh, just an outlook into what the future of AI and molecular engineering could look like. All right, so this is my lab at Chalmers. So we started in uh, January and um, this year I've managed to uh, recruit some very talented students. So uh, we're a small group with uh, three PhD students. We have also a visiting PhD um, and then two master students. Um, and we're working at the interface of machine learning, chemistry, and the life sciences in a computer uh, science department. So here's um, a little bit of what uh, kind of problems we're interested in. So one of the main uh, pillars of research in our team is the use of generative AI for molecular engineering and, and developing these tools. Um, so we're particularly interested in and generative AI for targeted protein degradation, uh, for phenomics guided drug discovery, uh, language models for synthesizability constrained molecular design, and then um, that makes up kind of the first pillar for now. Uh, we're also quite interested in structured representation learning, and one area where we're um, particularly interested in is in learning meaningful representations of cells. So frequently we're, when we're making uh, kind of predictions of different molecular properties, um, let's say the um, different bioactivities, um, we have the experimental counterparts, but all experiments have to be carried out in some sort of cell, and this is something that's frequently, re re not rejected, neglected in, in generative AI. Um, so how can we learn meaningful representations of cells so that we can make predictions uh, that is relevant to that particular experiment? And then the third pillar is multimodal machine learning, um, in particular with molecular dynamics data, although I won't be talking about that today. Um, so we can summarize our uh, group's research interests as uh, we're all trying to kind of answer this question of how can we best use AI in order to uncover biological and, and chemical insights. And I think many of you also share this, this goal. All right, so now we can kind of get started uh, talking about generative AI. Um, so I, I believe um, all of you, uh, if not most of you, is quite familiar with uh, uh, generative AI and what we can do with it. Uh, but just to get everyone on the same page, in case you haven't heard the term gen AI, it just stands for generative AI. Um, and that's the, the use of AI in order to generate new data instances. Um, this can be text, this can be images, audio, 3D objects, it can be code, which is also text, graphs, and so on. Um, so some key examples of this is models like ChatGPT uh, for, for generating dialogue and, and various, various other things, uh, Midjourney, GitHub Copilot, and so on. And so I titled this slide, uh, you know, the year of generative AI, 2023, uh, because this is the year that it feels like Gen AI has finally entered the mainstream. So nearly everyone is using it in some way, right? So we have many discussions now ongoing on how um, this is affecting education, for instance, because everybody is, is using it. Um, and from the scientific point of view, this is mostly a good thing, uh, since it helps us um, kind of uh, push a lot of our research forward. And, and that's a lot of what the, the rest of this talk is going to be about, how Gen AI is helping us um, uh, progress scientifically. I did put that this is only kind of mostly a good thing since 
um, the recent advances have also made it so that um, this kind of existential AI threat dialogue has also now entered the mainstream. So this is also now something that uh, makes a lot of people fearful uh, of AI, but we won't talk about that here. So as mentioned, we can, we can generate anything for which we have lots of data, and this can be text or images, but more interesting, uh, at least to me, is the generation of molecules or proteins. And uh, it's quite nice to just be able to generate, you know, any molecule and a protein, but um, it's more interesting uh, when we want to sample from either a conditional or joint distribution, right? We want to generate molecules, for instance, not just any molecule, but molecules that let's say, bind strongly to one particular protein target or uh, molecules with specific range of physicochemical properties. And we're going to focus on, on the use of Gen AI for different kind of molecular generation tasks here. So how do we actually use Gen AI to engineer new drugs? So we'll start with our, our generative model, which I frequently depict with a paintbrush and a neural network. Um, since it can be quite creative. And we uh, condition it on a set of desired properties. So maybe we want uh, target binding um, activity or binding to a specific protein target. We want it to be selective to that protein, not bind any other proteins. Uh, we want our molecules to have uh, a nice kind of uh, range of physical chemical properties. We want them, of course, to be synthesizable. Um, that way we can actually test them in a lab. And you know, maybe th there's so many other things we can, we can tell our model. Um, so uh, we can also provide our model with information on what is the available chemistry that we know. So what's the available building blocks we can purchase? Uh, what are the uh, available chemical reactions that we have in-house? And then the model in, will kind of generate um, um, in its own way a set of optimized uh, molecules that it, it believes to best satisfy these criteria. And uh, one of the things that makes generative AI especially relevant now is that it can be continuously updated with, with new data. Um, and as kind of lab automation uh, becomes more and more common and, and uh, a lot of data is, is uh, born you know, already digitally, then we can very easily continue to update our models in this way. So much faster than any human can possibly, you know, process all this data or read the literature. So this all started around 2016 uh, with the first uh, um, deep learning method uh, published for molecular design. So this was the SMILES uh, BAE or variational autoencoder. Uh, we won't talk um, in detail about it. Uh, but ever since then, there's been a sort of explosion of uh, generative models for molecular design. And, and I show various different uh, kind of uh, examples here uh, just to illustrate different kind of architectures you can have. So you can have um, LSTMs, you can have graph methods, uh, you can have um, genetic algorithms, there's a GAN up there, um, and so on. Uh, and we can also generate not just small molecules, but also proteins. So one of these, uh, this one here is an example from RF diffusion uh, from the Baker lab, which is used to, um, to engineer proteins with a specific 3D shape. So to, to get the sequence that will give you that shape. All right, so a lot of models, many things to choose from. But how do we actually use these um, in order to engineer targeted protein degradation modalities? And I promise I'll clarify what this is, because it's a, a big word. So um, most commonly, generative AI has been applied to the design of small molecule binders or proteins. And so small molecule um, inhibitors, we can think, typically think of them as we have a protein very, with a very well-defined binding pocket. Um, and then the, our small molecule binder can just come in bind to the protein at that pocket, kind of stay there, um, and then that leads to a change in function for that protein. And we have some examples of small molecules um, uh, here. Uh, we can also generate proteins with no problem. But one area that hasn't been really explored is the design of large small molecules. Um, so this is molecules, let's say, with 50 to 200 heavy atoms. Um, and 
one particular class of molecules that falls in this range, and it's very, very exciting uh, new class of molecules, is heterobifunctional degraders. Uh, so one example of this is proteolysis targeting chimeras, or PROTAX, uh, which one can use for targeted protein degradation. Um, so typically they're, they're quite large molecules consisting of three components. So you have the warhead that binds your protein of interest, so that's the protein you want to degrade in the cell. Uh, you have an E3 ligand, which binds to an E3 ligase, so another protein. Um, and then an organic linker that connects these two. So I represent it using this kind of green square and pink triangle here. Um, and um, basically the way it works is that in the cell, it can bring together your E3 ligase system, your protein of interest for just long enough to allow ubiquitin transfer to occur to your target protein. So this marks it for degradation by the proteasome and it gets degraded into its component parts. So what, what does this mean? Um, why do we like these? Um, so not only is it a very like, kind of fun mechanism, but we can see that here we no longer need to have a very strong binding affinity to our target protein, since we're no longer constrained to proteins with well-defined binding pockets. So we can leverage even weak binding affinity. Uh, and we also see that we have here now a catalytic mechanism of action. We don't need a one-to-one -one kind of um, um, ratio of our, of our drug relative to our target protein. Um, the molecule can be reused and go on to degrade many other proteins. Um, so this means that we can potentially target a broader range of proteins at much lower doses. So we find this very interesting. And, uh, there's not a lot of work that's been done in generative models applied to these modalities because they are large molecules. So the chemical space also um, is very large uh, when you want to think about all the different possible ways you can combine atoms if you have um, you know, 150 heavy atoms in a molecule, how many ways you can combine things. Um, so here we explore the use of graph invent, which is a generative model uh, using graph neural networks and reinforcement learning. Um, so we apply this to the design of protect-like compounds. Um, to do this, uh, we had to build a surrogate model for protein degradation activity. Uh, so something that tells us how likely is it that our proposed molecule will degrade that target protein or not. Um, and this is a machine learning model that's conditioned on um, the protein sequences for both our E3 ligase and our target protein, a PROTAC, um, um, a fingerprint for our PROTAC molecule, um, and then our, our cell type. And we use this model um, as a reward uh, for the, in order to compute the rewards for our reinforcement learning agent. Um, I won't go into the technical details here. You can check out uh, the paper. Um, it was submitted to an Arabs workshop last year. Uh, but what do we see? So here we have kind of an overview, big picture of how the reinforcement learning framework looks like. So we start from a pre-trained generative model, and it's very important that we start from a pre-trained model uh, because we need a good prior. Uh, then we sample um, some molecules uh, from our agent, which was initialized to that pre-trained model. We go on to score them using our reward function, which we designed. Um, and then molecules that look like promising degraders will get a reward. Those that don't look like uh, good degraders will not get reward. And we repeat this until, until we're satisfied or the model converges. And what we find when we do this is that uh, if we might have had 40% predicted active degraders um, in our model initially, we can augment kind of the, the number of predicted highly active degraders uh, from our, that are sampled from our model up to 80%. Um, and 100% of them are also novel, given that it's quite a large chemical space. And this is, this was very exciting to us, but it comes with some caveats because um, this is all trained on public protact data, uh, which um, is number one limited and has some other issues. Uh, so when we take a close look at our kind of um, our predictive model for protein degradation activity, uh, here we have a plot where the gray bars represent the, um, the molecules that were correctly classified as active or inactive, um, and the red bars represent uh, the incorrectly classified molecules. Uh, we see that uh, at the kind of tail ends, if it's you know, very, very much inactive or very much active, it, the model is quite good there, but when it gets kind of close to this boundary of what we decided, this threshold of what we decided was active or inactive, 
um, it's making a lot of mistakes. And that's problematic because the reinforcement learning agent is going to exploit any kind of um, uh, weakness in our reward function uh, when generating molecules. But it's not the, the end of the road. So we're still continuing to work on this. Um, uh, and we've um, recently developed a toolkit for, for studying protein degradation in Protax and working with this public data. Um, so we have a very st talented student, Stefano here, um, who's built a very nice um, data curation pipeline for uh, different public uh, data sets for, for Protax data containing degradation activity and whatnot. Um, he's also built a nice pipeline for um, training and testing different models, um, as well as created a set of machine learning ready uh, data sets uh, for studying protect degradation activity. However, when we look at various different architectures, so we can look at graph neural networks, we can look at feed forward networks, uh, tree based models, and look at the kind of accuracy uh, for how well we're predicting degradation activity, uh, we see that we kind of hit an upper bound in terms of what we can predict, um, no matter if we add more data to our training set. Um, and this has kind of made us, um, we're hypothesizing that there's perhaps a limit to what we can learn from the t 2D data and the 2D representations which we're using. And it makes sense when you think about it. Um, so. Um, having a highly active degrader requires the formation of a good ternary structure. So this is um, a case where 3D information is quite important. Um, and we believe that's kind of being able to accurately model this um, and include that in our predictive models is going to be crucial in order to better predict the degradation activity here of Protax. Um, so this is uh, some ongoing work. You can stay tuned uh, for this. But, but I do want to say something here, and that's um, uh, even though we kind of see that there's a limit to what we can do with 2D data, I think it's still the right strategy to start with the simpler model first and then go on and try the, the more complicated one. Frequently what you see, or at least what I see when reviewing papers, is uh, people trying kind of the most complicated thing first um, when sometimes having tried something in between could have um, even like a tree-based model could have been just as good. So good to do appropriate baselines. Um, Let's see. So with this in mind, we're exploring some new strategies for predicting protein degradation activity. Um, so the first is there's a lot of missing data, mislabeled data in these public databases. Um, so we were taking some self-supervised learning approaches in order to label some of these incomplete entries. Um, and this has been corrected in, the, um, uh, in our paper that's currently in preparation. Um, so that will be out soon. We also need better representations, um, and we can improve learning with multimodal models as well. And then one thing I haven't uh, talked about yet is synthesizability constraints and how these need to be integrated um, into our models um, in order to kind of generate only protects that are likely to be synthesizable, and we can actually test in the lab. So with that, I want to talk about synthesizability constraint molecular design, since that's um, an area that's frequently kind of neglected um, in generative AI. So it's very fun to generate molecules, but very few people seem to want to constrain them to only synthesizable um, molecules. And um, we, here we can talk about one strategy, one way that we've taken at least to, to tackle this. So synthesizability constrained molecular generation is just the generation of molecules which are guaranteed to be synthesizable using known chemical reactions and building blocks. Um, and this is very important um, to take into account when building these kind of models since it builds trust in your AI. Um, if you show uh, you know, a chemist um, a bunch of molecules where they can very quickly see that they cannot make any of them, then they're not gonna trust your model. Um, and this is something that um, we frequently see when, uh, when this, in discussions with chemists. So this is a quite important thing to them. Um, so how can we actually uh, do this? One, one way we've uh, approached this problem is uh, through this model called SynNet, uh, which we developed uh, when I was in my, my previous postdoc position. And this is a generative model that's conditioned on the molecular embedding and generates a synthesis tree. Uh, so this synthesis tree contains your optimized molecule 
uh, as the root node, as well as the potential synthesis route for that molecule. And it does this in a bottom-up approach, so starting from the building blocks and finishing with your target molecule. So here's an overview of that architecture. Um, so we start from an empty graph, uh, and then we go on to select different building blocks, which are represented by these rectangles. Um, uh, so initially, we, all we can do is like select the building block, add it to our empty graph, and then uh, continue from there. So the different lines represent unimolecular reactions. Lines coming together like this represent bimolecular reactions. Um, and that's currently uh, where the model is limited uh, to uh, bimolecular reactions. And yeah, um, so I, I won't go through this in detail just to show you that um, and emphasize that the model is working in a bottom-up approach, starting from building blocks, finishing with our optimized molecule. And ideally, if the model uh, kind of works correctly, if it's able to find a solution, then the final root molecule here, the product molecule, should correspond to the embedding, um, the molecule that was embedded here um, at the start. And uh, we won't go through the architecture, I just want to highlight that it's four different networks here working uh, kind of together. We have two networks for um, regression, two to classification, for selecting the different reactants and the reaction that's going to be used in order to, to build up the synthesis tree. And what does this look like when, when it works? So um, I'll show you an example of that. Um, so here we have a reaction um, or the, the synthesis tree corresponding to, to this target molecule. Um, so this was what the model received as input, so a fingerprint corresponding to this target molecule. And it returned to us uh, this synthesis tree shown here, where the root molecule of our, of our tree was um, uh, this one that I just put in the box. Um, what you can see if you look at both of them is that they're an exact match. Um, which is fantastic, especially considering that this molecule was not in the training data, so the most similar molecule in the training data um, is shown up here. Um, and uh, that's the Tanimoto similarity that's uh, written under it. Um, so the highlighted parts, the blue highlighted parts correspond to that, which is kind of the exact match uh, between our most similar molecule and our input uh, molecule. So this is great, however, the model is not always successful at finding a synthesis route, so um, this is an example of that. Where here we showed the model a fingerprint corresponding to this uh, uh, molecule up there that's now in the box, and the model returned to us a synthesis tree where the root node was that molecule um, up there. And now if you compare the two molecules in the boxes, you see that they are not the same. Uh, they share some similarities, but it's definitely not the same molecule. Um, and here's a scenario where, you know, is it, is it that this molecule can indeed not be synthesized uh, with the available building blocks and available reactants? Um, and so the model has then predicted um, a synthesizable analog, so a molecule that perhaps shares the similar properties to our desired molecule but is actually synthesizable, or did the model just fail? And this is very hard to, to kind of... Um, to know what is the reason exactly without going in for each individual case and then, and then looking at it. Um, but the point is that in taking this bottom-up approach uh, to building synthesis trees to your molecules, you will always get kind of an answer. Uh, if you don't get your target molecule, um, then you'll get a synthesizable analog. All right. And in terms of, um, while we're still talking about synthesizability, um, some more recent work we've done, this is in collaboration with AstraZeneca, is um, exploring um, and comparing template-based approaches uh, to synthesis planning uh, and comparing those to template-free approaches. Uh, so one example of a template-free method is something like the CAMFORMER, uh, where you're doing basically sequence-to-sequence -sequence translation. You can treat the chemical reactions as, as text. Um, whereas in template-based, you have basically a classification task where um, every single reaction is a different class. Um, so two different approaches. And uh, what we were wondering is, you know, how can we design a synthesis planning tool where these two different approaches can work together for better retrosynthetic recommendations? So, yeah, once again, the conformer is a transformer-based method for single-step retrosynthesis uh, 
prediction. And we compared it to the template-based methods. And so that's work that's now in the, in the Chem Archive. Um, I won't go into it here, but basically the punchline is that uh, when you look at different reaction classes that are uh, widely used in, in drug discovery, uh, for instance, neither one of these kind of leading approaches was able to, um, uh, was best at each of the reaction classes. So for some reaction classes, the conformer or template-free approach was better. For other reaction classes, the, uh, the template-based approach, which was AI synth in this case, uh, was better. Um, so one strategy we proposed is to first use the template-based approach um, in order to, to see if you can find any synthetic routes uh, that has advantages since there you also know that every kind of reaction you predict corresponds to something in the literature. Um, and then if you can't find a route there, go on and try the, trans the conformer um, and see if that predicts a, uh, or finds a pathway there. So, yep. I encourage you to check out the, the paper there for, for more details. I want to end by talking about some data sharing challenges we face in chemistry. Uh, so this being that there's currently no public comprehensive database of all known chemical reactions. Um, and if you're thinking right now, well, yes, there is, the emphasis is on the word public. Um, so available reaction data is either proprietary, um, heavily imbalanced towards successful reactions, um, a lot of the historical reaction data is unstructured as well. It can be buried in lab journals, PDFs, um, SIs, images, sketches, what, whatever. It's, it's all over the place. And there's very little incentive to actually deposit this reaction data, especially for failed experiments. This creates significant additional work. It's time consuming to, to prepare and it's not the standard in the field. So this is just an illustration of all the different, or some different ways in which we can uh, represent chemical reactions. And this does not even include all the different ways you can see reactions represented in, um, in like a SI for a, P, for a paper, for example. But it's a very hard problem. Um, that's kind of try, a way to try to understand how we can maybe get, um, more groups to deposit the reaction data. We looked at other successful data sharing initiatives in biology and chemistry and looked at what factors um, helped in their success. So uh, we looked at the CSD, the P2B, uh, PopChem, and Campbell. Um, and this is just a plot of like the number of um, entries uh, over time. Uh, where, yeah, the CSD started quite early actually. It's quite interesting. Um, and we, we looked at kind of different strategic decisions that we're taking either at the time of founding uh, the different uh, database or as it was continued and how that uh, might have contributed to, to the adoption of these different uh, models. So we won't go into this table here. Uh, but basically what we conclude from this is that um, maybe one of the most effective things we could do right now is push for data sharing mandates by funding agencies. Um, so if you have a, a, a mandate, uh, this creates a very strong incentive for you as a group to publish your data, uh, because if you don't make your data fair, let's say, then you cannot get the funding or, or cannot continue to receive funding from that organization. Um, this can accelerate the adoption of your reaction data um, uh, sharing tools, uh, meaning that better tools will also be developed and then that data sharing becomes easier. So it's, um, it's kind of, how do you say, Everyone benefits from, from doing this. Um, there's benefits you know, for both the data producers and the consumers, so not just the people running the experiments and uploading the data, um, and not just benefits for those who is, you know, uh, people like me, who's using machine learning models um, um, in order to, to make better predictions. Um, so everyone benefits from uh, having the better tools and then having the better data and so on. We've thought about how we can um, improve the accessibility um, of reaction data, both in the past, present, and future. So thinking about extracting uh, data from kind of historical documents uh, or from just things from the past, uh, this would require uh, a development of tools for unstructured reaction data extraction. Uh, if we look at the present there, there's a few things we can do here. One is, uh, uh, improve our use of ELNs, electronic lab notebooks and translators in order to structure data, um, as well as to centralize existing reaction data. And we propose here the use of the Open Reaction Database, or ORD, 
uh, for this, um, since that's, there's been a lot of work uh, gone into that. Um, and then uh, looking towards the future, um, we believe that a lot of reaction data is just simply going to be born digital. Um, and that's going to be uh, a lot easier. I mean, it's going to be structured already, and we just need to deposit it somewhere where other people can access it. Um, so I um, encourage you to check out the, the perspective here in JCAM if you're interested to, to learn more. And then I'd want to end uh, with, I think we're doing on time. I started a bit early, so I'm just going to skip a bit ahead to um, kind of how we can improve our use of AI in molecular design. Um, so um, we can very easily generate molecules that are chemically valid. Uh, but that doesn't mean necessarily that they are good molecules, right? Um, there's some things that need to be prioritized in terms of the development of tools for molecular engineering. So uh, one is selecting the right objective function uh, when you're doing your optimization. Uh, you frequently see people choosing some, some strange things, so you have to make sure you're choosing the right thing here. Uh, synthesizability constraints uh, need to be integrated. Um, when we like data, we've heard a little bit about this uh, at this conference uh, so far, so the use of active learning for better experimental design, um, and then higher quality data production will lead to better circuit models that we can in turn use um, to generate even more high quality data. Um, and then something uh, more relevant to drug discovery is the uh, development of better translational tools. So to summarize, I uh, give you an overview of the use of Gen AI for molecular engineering, particularly in drug design. I showed you some active work on the development of open source data-driven molecular design tools. I uh, gave a push for data sharing mandates by funding agencies. Um, and then um, it's all to say that kind of the results of these works are steps towards improved data-driven approaches to drug discovery. Um, and I showed them um, here. Uh, mainly focused on drug discovery, but you can use it also in other molecular engineering domains, um, like some of the ones that you're working on here. So with that, I just want to thank uh, all the people who worked on this uh, work with me, so uh, members um, of my group, uh, other folks at Chalmers and the Coley Lab, and our industry collaborators. Um, and thank you all for your attention today. So thank you very much for a nice talk. We have a time for two questions, approximately. Please. Thank you. Thanks for this great talk. I had a question on the SUN, the SUNnet model. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the model connects the initial with the final structure, and but I was. And, and it does so by finding the reaction paths, right? I was wondering, can this be somehow related to a quantitative uh, score of the synthetic viability? Or is it just if it doesn't find a reaction, then it's unlikely to be yeah, with realized the, with the known reaction elementary steps? With a lot of synthetic planning tools, it's basically you, you can assign different criteria for when you're going to stop looking for a pathway. Because you find it, if you find a solution, that means you found a pathway. Otherwise, your model has failed. And you, can you found a pathway based on the known reactions on which yes. the model was trained. Exactly, based yeah. on the set of reactions you've shown the model and the uh, reactants. Um, so um, this is also a limitation when it comes to template-based approaches, mm -hmm. that you're constrained to the reactions you already know. Things like conformer can hallucinate, which is interesting, but also can be bad, because you can also propose reactions that maybe do not exist. Um, but generally, you're assigning, let's say, a time limit or a certain kind of reaction depth as well. Because you don't also, it's possible that you could find a pathway, but it could be like 30 steps long, uh, and that's not going to be useful to anyone. So there's different criteria you can set for stopping. Often, the it search. can be useful to have a quantitative score, some type of measure of the synthetic viability within X steps or so. But that's not really the target of SUNNET, right? That's no, we don't, we don't give a score like that. Just okay. you found a pathway or you did not. But you can assign scores if like, you want to assign, let's say, a cost to each of the different. You have a heuristic for that, um, the different costs okay. for the different and pathways. And in principle, then you could use a cumulative cost across the different uh, that comes out. Yeah. Okay. Many things you can do. Yeah.
Thank you, Rotheo, for a very nice talk. So, uh, you were talking about the 3D information, and I agree with you that, of course, we should have more information for the models if we include the 3D, but uh, there's also the problem that you need to pick the 3D structure, and it's like, how would you solve that? Yes, that was a comment, no? No, it's more like, okay, would you pick, you need to pick a confirmation. So it's like, ah, would you I, pick I the lowest hear. energy confirmation, then you need to do confirmation or sampling. Would you use like an ensemble of structures or? Yeah, it, I mean, it depends on your specific scenario. If you need like the low energy structure or something else. Um, in the case of Protax, um, we have, for instance, a few experimental structures uh, for the ternary complexes. And there are some questions you can ask here. Is this, is this really the complex you see? you know, right before ubiquitination occurs, or is this a different complex because maybe you were able to crystallize it because ubiquitination did not occur, right? So there's many kind of um, challenges. Um, but generally speaking, for the things I showed here, we'd be interested in, in low energy confirmations um, for the different complexes. Not sure if I answered your question. So, yeah, so, so would you, how would you find this lowest energy confirmation? We're trying different approaches. Um, we've been trying with AlphaFold uh, for some time, but it doesn't work so great because um, that's not in the training data. But there is um, now the new AlphaFold, the white paper that came out last, last month, right? So if that's released at some point, we'd, be, we'd love to try that. Uh, we're also trying other like docking approaches as well to generate some of these ternary complexes. Uh, but it's, it's challenging. Huh? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I think we need to move on, so we thank you once more.